Welcome and thank you for joining us for today's Dealer On webinar where an industry veteran, Charlie Vogelheim, is going to dissect the internet, third parties and vendors. My name is Eliana Raggio and I'll be your moderator today. And today's webinar is being presented by Dealer On. And for anyone who isn't familiar with Dealer On, we're an award-winning website development company and digital agency best known for our amazing SEO, the absolute best customer service and the highest converting website designs in the industry including the brand new Chameleon Responsive Website Platform. And I'm thrilled to announce that DealerOn has been named again as a top-rated website provider in the 6th Annual Driving Sales, Driving Sales Dealer Satisfaction Awards. Hey, and we also won the Pinnacle Award from the AWA. That's the highest award a website provider can get. And for more information on who we are and what we do, please check us out at our gorgeous brand new DealerOn website at DealerOn.com. And don't forget, we will be exhibiting at the upcoming Digital Dealer Convention. We'll be at booth 300. That should be an easy one for you to remember. And we have a great show in store for you today. We're very pleased to have the one and only Charlie Vogelheim as our presenter today. Charlie Vogelheim has 30 years of automotive industry experience, including roles as executive editor at Kelly Blue Book and the vice president at JD Power. He is currently involved in a variety of initiatives, including Motor Trend Audio, Driving Sales, Ryan Tech, and Web Cars China. Charlie is an auto enthusiast whose career has been centered on observing and supporting the automotive industry, whether providing vehicle information and values or helping dealers with digital marketing and technical development, he has consistently represented cutting-edge solutions to industry challenges. He put Kelly Blue Book online and created both the JD Power Internet Roundtable and Driving Sales Executive Summit. Charlie travels extensively and is often a featured speaker at automotive seminars, educational meetings, and media interviews. And he can be reached at charlie.vogelheim at gmail.com. And if you want to hear the sweet, dulcet tones of his voice, well, you can check out his very popular weekly podcasts on iTunes. You don't want to miss it. Now, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please use the question feature located on the corner of your screen to submit them. At the end of the presentation, we'll answer those questions of general interest. If we're unable to get to your question live, don't worry, we're going to try and respond to you by email later today. Also, don't forget, a link to download a copy of this webinar recording will also be emailed to you later today for your reference. And hey, go ahead and share it with your friends and colleagues. I'm okay with that. And guess what? Oh, this is a good one. Our good friends at Motor Trend Audio, they're giving away an incredible prize today on the webinar. Actually, this might just be the coolest prize ever. One of you lucky webinar attendees is going to be winning a guest spot at an upcoming Motor Trend Audio podcast with Charlie Vogelheim. That's right, you heard me. The date is yet to be determined, and the topic? Well, guess what? You get to choose that, too. As long as it's about cars, you will be a guest of the show to join the conversation with Charlie and discuss issues that affect our industry. <laughs> totally awesome, right? Now, you have to be on the live broadcast to win it, though, so stay tuned, and you could be the one walking away with this tremendous prize today. Also, at the conclusion of the webinar, you're going to receive a short survey, so fill it out. We're always looking for great feedback from our audience. Today, we're going to randomly select a couple of people from all the completed surveys to also win some Google prizes. So let's get started. Let's listen as industry veteran Charlie Vogelheim dissects the Internet third parties and vendors. Charlie Vogelheim, I cannot tell you what a pleasure it is to have you on my show. I have been a fan of yours for years. Thank you so much for being here today. Well, it's my pleasure to be here. And First of all, you know, I just love the sound of your voice, and not only the, the sound, but the, the happiness or enthusiasm in it. So I'd rather you continue the presentation than I. So. <laughs> I wish. If, if only I knew as much as you, I might do it. But you know what, Charlie? Thank you so much for the compliments. But really, everyone's here to, to hear from you. And this is fascinating. Um, I love that in the description of the webinar, we said you were going maverick. You know, you've been so nice, so kind. You are. You're the, one of the nicest guys I've met in the auto industry. And... This is so funny that you're just going to lay down the hammer today and tell us okay, what you wait. really no, think. You know, uh -huh. I'm going to have you stop talking now, so let's go over <laughs> a little bit because the title is pretty darn interesting. I'd love to hear what I'm going to talk about. Let's go over. 
a couple of decades. So. I'm just going to you know, share my perspective, and, and because I now live in Marin County, I have to, have to do something holistic, so let's develop a holistic understanding of the industry we're all involved in, including some of the challenges and complexities, and what a freaking awesome biz cards is. I want to go over that, and uh, you know, I'm going to show way too many slides. Hopefully, you leave you a couple takeaways, and maybe I'll have some questions, and, and more importantly, maybe I have some answers, but uh, we'll see how that goes. I hope so. Charlie, we have a lot of stuff to get to. Please, take it away. The floor is yours. I'm, I'll do it. Yeah, and the topics I'm going to cover, personal experiences, 20th anniversary of the Internet this year. Started in 95. We'll go over that. The changing mobility. Consumer point of view is, I think, important. I want to stress that because of what I'm doing now with Motor Trend. I get a lot of time with them, and that's what I was afraid of. So we're going to just, every now and then, this thing is going to step out, and we're going to step right back in, but that's okay. Um, and then uh, we're going to talk about disruptive technologies and uh, some of the priorities maybe you should have. What we're not going to talk, talk about is any, any process specifics. I'm not going to go over that. You guys have wonderful speakers here, David Kane not too long ago, that goes over all the basics and, and things. I'm going to be talking about BDC, BDD, or even BYU. I'm going to talk about SEM or SEO or STP. Alternative fuels, well, if you want me to, I could talk about that a little bit, but please don't bring up how Gonzaga lost at home last week on senior night. <laughs> so let's get going here. I always like to begin with description of the automobile. I know it seems uh, simple to everyone, but let's face it. It's a lot of things to a lot of different people. Some people it's just an appliance. To some people it is a ride. To some people it is a work of art. We know it's transitioning for a lot of people into an office, and certainly for, uh, for many people, it is the center of socialization. It was way long ago when, when we were growing up. It was our, our social media, so to speak, because it was how we got to see our friends and, and where they were was uh, all through the car, because the uh, landline at home was usually occupied by our sisters. But uh, for the car dealers, it's sometimes a little bit different. You know, it's, it, it's just a job to some. It's, it's a challenge in terms of moving the metal. It's a money maker, certainly for many, and uh, kind of the fun part about this business, it, it, for many of us, it, it's it's a family business. It's part of the family. So depending how you look at it, you know, maybe it's the same, maybe it's different than the way the consumers do. For me, I've had a, a great uh, experience. I can't believe it's been 30 years. I'm just starting to learn things, but uh, uh, I did work with a couple of key family businesses to start out. I started at Kelly Blue Book back in '85. Uh, worked there 20 years and then went over to J.D. Power & Associates. Since then, I've had an opportunity to work with IntelliChoice, Car Driver Motor Trend, Digital Airstrike uh, when it started up, and even before that when they were involved with Response Logics, uh, Microsoft and some of the great solutions they have, and of course, in between the National Auto Auction Association. And uh, if you mentioned in the beginning, I'm doing some work in China, which uh, I won't bother everyone with. So that's what it looked like to me when I started. I was about 12 years old, obviously. But um, starting at Kelly Blue Book, spent all my time, uh, a lot of the time, at the auctions. I was gathering data, you know, putting together the information for the book. I want to talk about Kelly real quick just because of its background. Um, started as a car, car dealership. A lot of you know that, but it's kind of fun to review. You look at the pictures that it was uh, advertised to be the largest dealership in the world at the time. Located in Los Angeles on lovely Figueroa Avenue, where the uh, Staples Center and Convention Center are now. Um, but a couple of the keynote things to take away from Kelly, the company, and I obviously could spend a lot of time with it, but had a very trusted odometer setting. You know, back then people were known to, uh, to switch around the odometer. Well, all the cars at Kelly had zero on the odometer. You know, why, why worry about whether it's been spun? Then they just put them all back to zero so everybody knew right where they were starting. But they offered a guarantee from that point, which was uh, was actually kind of leading the industry. And they had a couple of things that they did that I always like to share. And one of those was, you know, um, after the war, when the service people would come off the boats or ships or got, came to Los Angeles, they'd, they'd need a car and they'd ask a taxi driver to take them to a dealership. And, and Kelly was, uh, was spiffing the, the taxi drivers that brought service people to the store, which uh, talk about... Uh, building your own customer base, boy, they were, they were a forefront of that. And then the, the word spare change is there is because whenever they took a car and trade in, they had a jar of change in the office, and they'd just reach over, grab a handful of coins, and throw it in an envelope and a little note that said, hey, thanks for, for bringing your car here. Oh, by the way, we were cleaning the car out. We found this. 
and uh, by the way, thought you might want it back. It's in you know a little bit over as far as you know maybe um, you know twenty three seventeen cents or something like that. But uh, it would uh, it would endear the the person that brought the trading in to uh, to think that they were uh, they were getting treated right. So what the heck. Um, Kelly, Blue Book, of course, when I started, it was a book. Uh, you know, it started before that as a dealer buy sheet. It was listing ceiling price during the war. That's why they have the word official value on it. If I can get this Microsoft uh, PowerPoint to behave itself, then we'll all be happier. Um, and then, uh, it, of course, was a regional guide, and we talked about that a little bit. It became a consumer guide, an Internet pioneer, and certainly now today you could describe it more as an information or, or an Internet company. Um, but I would look through all of those transitions, as Eliana mentioned, I you know, was very instrumental in putting it on the Internet. And part of that came from, you know, an attitude that I had that I called thinking outside the book. Um, you know, back then there were a lot of different books. It was Blue Book, Black Book, NADA guides are still around, obviously. Not so much you, you hear as much about Red Book, GALS is out on the East Coast, ALG for leasing, and AMR has since gone out of business. He, uh, that was for fleets. Uh, since then, of course, electronics came through AuctionNet, Mannheim Market Report, and everyone knows about Edmunds. There's also IntelliChoice, IntelliPrice, IntelliCar, the greater Intelli family. Um, and now, of course, we deal with the likes of uh, TrueCar, Viato, AEX, First Look. These are all solutions at dealers for, for pricing. But back then, it used to just be a book that fit in your pocket. And, of course, that's why the corners on Kelly were always rounded, so it would slide easy into your breast pocket on your shirt in and out. But, you know, thinking outside the book was, uh, was kind of wild in the day because it was a pretty stable business. It was had some barriers to entry in terms of cost of production and distribution and everything. But we always knew as the world was changing, um, maybe we need to change with it. And the world started changing a while previously by a young man by the name of J.D. Power the third, 42 years ago in 73, his company made the headlines because he was actually providing information provided by the consumers. You know, the information about the Mazda Wankel engine came from uh, consumer surveys. Uh, Mazda at the time wasn't even collecting all of that information. None of the automakers had a way of collecting information. So what Dave Power did, I mean, he was a disrupt disruptive technology. We're going to talk a little bit more about those. but. He talked about the voice of the consumer and put it in the forefront. And, and the things that we all are, are experiencing had to do with this solution or this company that this man created. Now, you know, we'll divide out CSI, which is the consumer satisfaction, which rates the product. And then he also created sales satisfaction, which rated the process. And that was the first time many of the dealers were kind of under the microscope and, and questioning some of the practices that maybe we're making them not so endearing to the consumers. I got to admit, you know, when I looked at them beginning, even before I joined the company, I thought a lot of the comparisons didn't make sense. I always was curious how a Volkswagen wouldn't rate as high as a Buick, and I learned that, you know, what JD Power does is they rate the product based on the owner or operator of that product. So they're asking Buick owners what they think about their Buicks, and they're asking Volkswagen owners what they think about their Volkswagens. And the difference what that creates is you know what, Buick people were happy with the vehicle. Maybe it was breaking down a lot. Maybe things uh, were going wrong, but it was an older clientele and they had extra time on their hands and it, and it wasn't so troublesome. Where the Volkswagen, in this example, was a very young clientele and just didn't have any tolerance for anything not working correctly all the time. Um, I have to admit that uh, measurements have gone wrong. You know, anytime you use a measurement for grading, uh, whether it's in school tests or in this case in dealer performance as the OEMs would use JD Power ratings to determine the success of certain dealers, measurements go wrong. And, and you know, whether it's a dealer filling out the form on behalf of the consumers or, or demanding, or OEMs demanding certain numbers get, you know, ridiculous numbers be reached, it, it's really unfortunate. But what can you say? But I got to admit also it's just gotten out of hand completely. There's, there's just way too much. Um, there's way too much surveys. There's way too much measurement going on. We're all, you know, we go buy a pencil at a, at a stationary store, and the next thing we know, we're getting an email that says, how's your pencil working? Was it good? Is your experience satisfactory? <laughs> well, it's become so ubiquitous sometimes. You know, you see this, that you, the quality issue, which was so very important for years and years in cars, has almost taken a back seat to other things. And uh, the, what I mean by that is 
when you go to an auto show or something like that, they don't always talk about the quality of the car because we've gotten to the point where it's just expected. We, we expect the cars to be of a certain quality, and uh, or they're not even in the U.S. marketplace. So going forward, while this is all going on, uh, in when I started in the industry, this thing called the computer came out. Yes, no, that's not exactly what mine you know, looked like. Mine looked a little bit more like this all the time. But, uh, <laughs> I remember that computer. That is scary. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I'm just, that's why my PowerPoint maybe isn't going to it upgraded a little bit or plug it in. You know, fortunately, we had the savior on the horizon to come out and make it all better for us. Hi. So you can, you can take a copy of this only on and put it on your desktop. So. Uh, th that is, I mean, I worship him, right? So. Yeah. <laughs> Look you at this bedroom eyes. How could you not? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, if you didn't like that his product, you had the, the, the beautifully designed uh, competition which, as you can tell, was, uh, was very uh, streamlined and, and, uh, from Apple. Anyway, um, we're all getting uh, desktops. You know, we, we we're transitioning from microcomputers to, to personal computers. Things are changing. We're starting to plug them in, and this Internet comes along. And what the heck is the Internet? Well, if I can quote an ABC executive, remember, they're in media, they're in television, they must know. The Internet will be the CB radio of the 90s. <laughs> Don't go away. Well, I was very excited because I had a CB radio, so I thought, well, then this can be pretty cool. <laughs> so now, as it comes out, you know, there's obviously a lot of people who are going to make a lot of money on it. You can even get a book, the 101 bestcom to start. I'm sorry if you're writing it in a book, then what makes you think you haven't had a better idea or somebody else has? And, of course, we remember a few that maybe came and, uh, and went pretty quickly, and that these companies you know, spent millions, literally, on uh, a failed market. Of course, Forbes reported that no one is successful on the Internet. You can't have a business on the Internet. The only people online are a bunch of crazy teenagers in the middle of the night. <laughs> so, and that's what they're saying about social media and the next big thing. Of course, there were a number of words that were not in our lexicon before the Internet that uh, we certainly say now, the word eBay, the word Yahoo, Google. Amazon was a river and CNET... Uh, was, I don't know, something you fished with, I don't know. But so so obviously there was success, and, and you could prove because they even had a magazine about it. So if you're an Internet company and you're online, then what better success could you have than to have old media to uh, to talk about what you're doing? Obviously there are a lot of people uh, making money on the Internet. I had hoped to be at one time. But, <laughs> um, but let me just say, as it, as it started to come out, and this is an old AOL screen, actually a couple years after the internet came along, they, they wanted content. Everybody wanted content on the internet. And what's the kind of information? And I just wanted to point out here, car shopping. Here's where you get information. So this was going to be great. So here we are. Consumerism, information, internet. It's all coming together, that big superhighway. Dave Powers bringing consumerism into it as everyone's getting a laptop, or I'm sorry, in this case, a PC computer back in the day. They can start tagging into the greater information set, and people wanted these values. They wanted used car values because guess what? Back then, the subscriber to the Blue Book maybe had an aunt's cousin's friend that worked at a credit union that would show you one. The guy at the dealership never did, but you could start to get that information. People wanted that. New car prices, oh my gosh, how great would that be? Even beyond that, transparency in pricing. And what that means, of course, is not how much did it cost, but what should I pay for this thing? And then we all thought, well, then what's going to happen is it'll be online negotiation. We'll talk about inventory avail availability and even alternative ways to buy cars. This was all the big future, and this Internet train rolled through town, and we jumped right on it. This is a Kelly Blue Book screen from way back. I, you know, I'm sure you want to just stall on the back of the, uh, these amazing graphics that we had on there. Um, but you know what? We had more than our competition. This is Edmund's early pages, and it's kind of cool. I mean, they're on, bus are hard, and this is back at the origin. But look at this quote here, and it's, it's kind of small print. Let me read it to you. One of the advantages for having Edmund's prices is you having accurate pricing information is a crucial, crucial part of negotiating a good deal for a new car. Oh, for crying out loud, get back here. I'm going to get this Commodore 64 replaced soon. Um, Anyway, the whole point here is that these uh, people are just so excited when they have the information available free 
it makes life that much easier. With the pricing information on hand, I was able to get a great deal on a 77 Acura Integra. Your information, what I have been able to usually, I'm sorry, the information made what could have been, and usually a nightmare, was a pleasant, rather short, two-hour experience. Thank you so much. So there they were, able to shorten the experience to two hours in the negotiation. So here we go. First car was sold on the internet. It was 1995, back in May. It was a Volvo 760. It was Marty Root. He created this company called DealerNet up in Seattle. He was a car dealer. He got all of the old OEM. He got the original OEM URLs. He had Ford.com, Chevy.com, all of them because nobody was doing it. DealerNet, in case you, you didn't know, got sold to this little company called Cobalt. Cobalt had YachtWorld.com and Home Scout. There was some guy named John Holt up there. And, oh, by the way, they provided some services to auto dealers. I think they've done okay. I forget exactly what they're doing now. Anyway, they actually got involved with this company called Microsoft that created this site called MSN CarPoint. Everybody kind of turned to Microsoft as we showed the pictures of the sultry Bill Gates way back there just to remind everyone that uh, they were the go-to for consumers for computers. Well, other sites started up, and I'm going to flip through these real quick, a bunch of them, because look at the theme on this. A new way to buy a car. The easiest way to buy a car. Buy a car through a trusted method. iMotors, you've never bought a used car like this. Car club, it's a better way to buy a car. And when I say everyone was getting involved, I mean everyone, because guess who was behind car club? Oh, wait, yeah, there it is, J.D. Power. It was a J.D. Power club. Cars Direct, remember them? America's number one way to buy a car. It was Scott Painter's first jump into all of this. And then, you know, it didn't work for everyone. Drive it off, I'm sorry, driveoff.com closed back in 01. Uh, car order, out of business, closing its doors. I forget what this one was, but <laughs> obviously we're not doing very well. <laughs> so anyway, I rushed through that just because I wanted to get to Auto Buy Tell. Auto Buy Tell started it all with Pete Ellis. And if you remember, that was the first Super Bowl commercial that involved all of this. And Pete Ellis, his name is right on there, president and CEO, a former car dealer in the Los Angeles area. Does everyone know what the tell and auto buy tell means? It's really I hard for me to hear everybody's hands. What's that? I thought it meant telephone. <laughs> it actually meant telefacsimile because it was all done by fax. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah, yeah kind of crazy. So anyway, um, Auto by Tell was out there, and Pete Ellis, of course, uh, was making all kinds of waves. Uh, went to J.D. Power Roundtables and talked about the possibilities of the Internet and was using the number thrown around around $6,000 is what it costs to market a car today. But uh, guess what? We, through the Internet, can significantly reduce that price. We can turn this price just on its head. I mean, it's just... Everything's going to be automated. We're going to take out all of these processes. We're going to significantly reduce the cost to market a car. And that was the promise from Auto Buy Tell and or any of the sites on the Internet that were associated with dealers. So we come to our first question. Oh, I guess that's it. I'm up. Okay, here we go. <laughs> Audience, we have your first of three poll questions on the screen now. We would love to know your answer to this. So we want to know, how do you think the cost of marketing a car has changed in the last 20 years since the inception of the Internet? It's a very interesting question. Even if you haven't been in the car industry for 20 years, just surmise. Do you think that the cost has been reduced significantly? Do you think they were paying more before the Internet? Do you think it's gone down but far from a reduction as promised? Do you think it stayed about the same and not much has changed? Or do you think it's actually gone up with the need for additional products? Because, you know, now on the Internet, you can't just, uh, m you know, place the car in one spot and be done with it. No, there's all these other things that you have to buy, too. Or do you think it's the last one, which is, heck, if I know, it's still all too confusing for me. I'm with you there. Anyway, um, once we get a majority of those votes in, we're going to close the poll and share the results. Oh, the votes are coming in fast. Thank you so much, everyone. This is great. I'll read the question one more time, and then we'll get to those answers. How do you think the cost of marketing a car has changed in the 20 years since the inception of the Internet? Do you think the cost was reduced significantly? 
Do you think it has gone down, but it's far from the reduction that was promised? Do you think it stayed about the same and not much has changed? Do you think it's actually gone up because of all the additional products you have to buy? Or you don't know, it's too confusing. Charlie, if you're ready, I'm going to, to all right, all right, here we go. Audience, thank you so much for getting involved with our poll questions. Like I said, we're going to have two more poll questions coming your way. Oh, I just clicked on the wrong thing. That was no good. All right, let's close this poll and share the results. So, 12% of today's audience believe that the cost was, in fact, reduced significantly. 28% of today's audience says they believe it's gone down, but far from the reduction that was promised. 20% of today's audience say they think it stayed about the same and not much has changed, but the majority, 40% of today's audience, said that they believe it's actually gone up because of all those additional products you need. Charlie, what do you think? Well, interesting, and, and certainly that's an ongoing uh, conversation that we have in terms of, you know, it, you know, when you take a single group, you, it, it is certainly at 40%. Um, the, uh, the idea kind of is, is, again, with all the added complexity, you know, in other words, maybe the costs have gone down on your traditional media, certainly, but what about all the other processes and, and things you need to get involved in? Boy, when you get your bill from a cars.com or auto trader or, or all of the different think tanks and, and, and processes that you, you've implemented, um, it's kind of amazing. So um, anyway, uh, let's get on with, with, let's talk about the product a little bit. So that, that's a little bit of the history, but around the background, we're talking about cars here. So that's the good news in all of this, and this is where I'm excited. So. You know, back in the day, there was a car for every household, so you saw it parked there. And uh, you know what? There's just, I'm just having a ball here. I want everyone to know that. How much fun! I have no uh, idea why it's doing that to you. No, it's just, it's just, a, it's a little bit of a, um, a power play from the PowerPoint. <laughs> Show them who's so, boss, Charlie. Show them who's boss. Exactly. <laughs> so, I actually you know, had that car. Then, that was my first car. There's your car. That was my first car that I ever owned. Is it? A bright red convertible Fiat Spider with a tan interior. Nice. So I'm going to um, get this off. Is this all good for you? You, you look great. Okay. You look great. <laughs> so we went from a car for every uh, household to a car for every driver and then to a car for every purpose. And this is just in the heyday. I mean, cars are selling left and right. We're, we're just exploding, you know. Uh, Year over year, records car sales, of course, then maybe you guys have heard about that world economic downturn or around for that. So what happens is we go from 17.5 million cars over a relatively short period of time down to, to 10.5 million. Seven million units are lost in overall sales, and it's just remarkable. I mean, it's just year after year after year, and, and in the process, we lost a lot of great brands, um, and not so great brands, but you can see them all on there that uh, are no longer with us. Um, and don't forget, we also lost Daewoo and Daihatsu and, well, Fisker kind of was DOA, uh, Koda. A couple just retreated, so, you know, the French, I won't make a comment. And then uh, some just stayed out for a little while with the Italians uh, that have gone away and since come back. So let's just see if we can get this going one more time or 1,000 more times. Um, is it just a blank screen at this moment in time? No, no, we still see your, like you're Beautiful. in PowerPoint mode. Right. Oh, well now it's a blank screen. <laughs> what happened? Okay, there we go. Okay. So, what we've got here now is, uh, it's, I just had to throw in the car that I drove. We were an Oldsmobile family, so we were very brand centric. You had so that car? You didn't have that, that is the original Oldsmobile, 1964. We had tan without the uh, um, without the roof rack. It was very stylish, fantastic. So, did it have seat belts in it? It didn't have seat belts uh, yeah. in it. We had seat belts, but we didn't use them because we just, you know, we had five kids, so we kind of were stacked in the back like lumber and rolled around the cars we uh, drove to and fro. I, so, yeah. I remember those days too. That was great. <laughs> we never used to use our seat belts. All right, go ahead. No, well, you didn't have to. So, I, you know what, I don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but I, I love it, is that people love cars. They just do. I mean, there's car shows, there's car collections, there's car movies, there's family trips, there's memories, there's, 
There's moments in your life that, 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 that hover around the car. But a lot of the love for the car really depends on whether you're moving or not. Um, this is, you know, whether you're out there enjoying. I, going back to that very first uh, shot that I, or the screen that I had in terms of the, um, uh, whether it's a ride or whether it's a piece of art and all of this, you know, unfortunately for some people, it really is an appliance or it's a way to get to and from work. And if they're not moving, they're trying to do something else. And this is just what's going on, whether we're eating or we're putting on makeup or I'm not wearing as much makeup as I used to. I probably should wear more. Or getting work done, um, there's a lot going on in the car. And it, part of it is because you can do it now. You know, back in the day, when that first Vista Cruiser picture, I mean, your interiors were pretty basic. I mean, no airbags or anything, which you know, the advantage of a steering wheel like this is if there was an accident, they could always find the driver because he was attached to the steering wheel. Um, but then things got safer. So obviously, um, the interiors got softer and had safety features on them. I'm getting good at turning this right back on. <laughs> You're, a um, You're such a proud. <laughs> and it got more complex. So all of a sudden, we had things that we could be doing in the car more. And so and that was called technology. And it was, it was all around us and, and all in the car. So now we have USB ports. We have Bluetooth, touch pads, backup cameras, heads-up display, surround views, voice recognition, or as so eloquently put at the recent World Series giveaway, we have technology and stuff. <laughs> so I don't know if anyone remembers this. This was the, uh, the lovely uh, Midwestern representative for Chevrolet giving away the Colorado describing it and saying it had technology and stuff. And hey, credit to Chevrolet for taking that and blowing it up on the internet and living and owning it. And uh, I thought that was awesome, the way that that happened, because here's this poor guy is a Kansas City fan, and this rotten Baumgartner has just beat his beloved baseball team, and he's got to give him a truck? How's that going to go wrong? <laughs> anyway, I digress. But that's not all. You know, now we've got intelligent crews, blind spot detection, lane departure. We've got braking override, accident presense. We've even got pedestrian recognition. And let's not forget my favorite of all options, the solar-powered shift knob illuminator. Good <laughs> So um, what this is doing, though, it's making this car, oh, wait, we're connected. I just remembered that. And we're learning that every day as Apple CarPlay is just being rolled out and Android Auto is in there. And we were, spent some time down at Google and learned a little bit more about all of that. And the car is really connected. And there's a whole conversation about what that really means in the connected car. But part of all this means is that now we can start having an autonomous car. We can have a car that is connected. And whether it's using cameras or mapping or uh, sensors, um, to a certain extent, what, you're sh what I'm showing here is the Audi. The Audi uh, autonomous car actually drove up Pikes Peak, Grace Pikes Peak. Uh, below, you show, you show the Google car, the test vehicle that has the, uh, the sensors. And if they've driven over 700,000 miles accident-free in Google cars, Google employees taking it to and from work. And of course, the upper right-hand corner shows the, the kind of goofy-looking autonomous Google car. And this is one now. It doesn't have even a steering wheel um, and or um, any form of pedals, any kind of driver input. So, you know, the nice thing about an autonomous car, if we go back to some of the op uh, options that you could get in cars back in the day, now you can really utilize that one forgotten option that was in the Cadillac, which was the six magnetic shock glasses that fit right on the open glove door there. So, these are the kind of options they just don't have in cars anymore. I'm not sure why. But uh, anyway, going back to cars, hey, if Google can make one, what about Apple? That would be something that makes sense, wouldn't it? Well, let's think about that. Apple is the number one recognized, most respected brand on the planet, second to Google. Apple's got nearly $200 billion sitting around. Uh, maybe they could use something to develop it. When you think about it, the car is essentially the premier mobile device. So let's think about that for just a minute. But before we think about Apple building a car, what about other places? What about other cars that we've talked about for years? Whatever happened to those? And the one that comes to mind, of course, China. You know, for a while we were talking about China. What about them bringing that car over there? It seemed like it was part of the discussion, and then it went away. You know, they put out that great Olympic. Well, when you think about a Chinese product, you don't really know or recognize one by brand name, do you? So the Germans, the Swedes, the Japanese, and Koreans all came over to the U.S. with cars, but they had products. 
They had appliances, they had electronics, they even had furniture from Sweden. And they had brand names that you recognize and that consumers would buy. And therefore, you know, making something as complex as a car, maybe, should be happening. You know, France, India, and China, they all have great food, which is an interesting thing to tie together, but they haven't been as successful over here for cars. So, you know, my experience at J.D. Power, I got to spend some time in China, and we, we certainly know the Chinese market is number one in the world, and everyone wants to be there, and everyone's building cars there. But when are they going to send one over here? And for a moment in time, we thought it was going to be Cherry. It was coming out any minute. You know, or Malcolm Brooklyn was going to bring it over. And then right after that, we were going to get BYD or Great Wall or Brilliance or Geely. So when are we getting that Chinese car? When is it coming? Well, this could have been one of the questions, but I'll answer it. They're coming now. It's called Volvo. Volvo is a Chinese car company. It is owned by Geely. It was rescued by Geely years ago. So they are in development. They're building an automotive development center somewhere in the western United States. Shortly, they're working on that right now, and that is the Chinese car coming in. I'm going to go back for a minute and say no Chinese product, right, by brand name. In other words, you're going to the store saying, oh, this is a Chinese version of this, whether it's a refrigerator or camera or anything like that. I just thought of one. I just thought of, well, actually, I've thought of it before because it's in the presentation. It's these Apple things. They're all made in China, for crying out loud. Yeah, they've got the Apple label on them, designed in California, built in China. So just a little something to think about, about the Apple car uh, possibilities. We'll get into that. There's other brands out there. You know, as I mentioned, uh, the Italian, the Alpha's coming back. Geely's over here. There's some boutique startups. We'll mention Tesla. And then, of course, from India and France and, and other parts of China, they're coming. So when I mention Tesla, let's talk about that a little bit. Wow, Tesla, right here in our own backyard, um, certainly uh, has making waves both uh, in the car industry and, and around retailing. Uh, not only that, but also in the world of, oh, I don't know, um, space exploration. The stock started flat and, uh, and then, of course, went uh, skyrocketed, so to speak. Uh, there's the beloved Elon Musk sitting there. Um, but there's a little bit more behind that than just building cars when you think about the success of Tesla. You know, you've got a rebate uh, for these electric cars coming from the government. Um, you've also got these municipalities putting in these recharging places, and, and even Tesla doing it themselves. So you essentially are uh, subsidizing the fuel costs. You've got carpool lanes. That's a huge deal here in, Southern, in California, north and south, in terms of selling electric cars. Every now and then a battery car blows up in flames. Ah, I don't know. I think that, you know, people are making a big deal out of that. But it begs the question, are you ready? <laughs> it, it begs the poll question. All right, well, here we go, audience. <laughs> so the question's on your screen now. We want to know, what do you think is the deal with Tesla? What's your opinion on Tesla? Please select one of the following answers. Do you think, love them, great innovation in technology and retailing? Do you think the cars are great but should be sold by dealers? Do you think the car is just a fad, it's too expensive, and Tesla is just going to go away soon? Do you think Elon is only in it for the batteries? Or do you think Elon Musk is secretly Iron Man? We want to know what you think. Pick one of those. Get your votes in, peoples. And then once we get a majority of those votes in, we're going to close the poll and share the results. We want to know, what do you think about Tesla? You think it's a great innovation in both technology and retailing? Do you think the cars are great? but you don't like their, their sales pitch, you think that they should be sold by dealers, do you think that whole Tesla thing is a fad, they're too expensive, and we're not going to be hearing from Tesla five, ten years from now? Do you think Elon Musk is only doing it for the batteries, or do you think Elon is secretly Iron Man? <laughs> and um, we do have one comment that came in, Tesla, great band. So yes, they, there is a rock <laughs> band named after them, 80s rock band, so thank you so much for that. But let's close this poll and share the results. Audience, thank you so much for your votes. You guys are awesome today. Here we go. All right, Charlie. The majority, 37% of my awesome audience, says they love Tesla. They think it's a great innovation in both technology and retailing. I, I have to... Uh, if I was allowed to vote, I would have probably picked that one as well. 17% um, said cars are great, but they should be sold by dealers. 17% said the car is a fad, it's too expensive, and they believe Tesla is going to be going away soon. 
9% said Elon Musk is only in it for the batteries, and 20% said they think <laughs> Elon Musk might very well be Iron Man. Uh, I Actually, probably, I probably would have picked that last one. <laughs> I could probably tell you which those 20% are. I think I could tell you by name. Well, I could tell you Sean Rains wrote, and he said Elon Musk is a modern-day cowboy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's so interesting. And if you didn't know, you know the uh, the movie Iron Man. By the way, you know most of the cars featured in that when he's walking around is are Elon's cars. So you know he's a part of it. Oh, the now I didn't know that. I did notice yeah. though that um, he was wearing an Iron Maiden shirt, which I thought was really fun. Wow, if you took out Maiden the last couple letters, it would just be Iron Man shirt. Well, they don't they have the song. I am Iron Man. Well, whatever. Okay, well, go ahead. Keep going. <laughs> I happen to be there. I, I just have to tell you real quick. I was at Tesla uh, meeting with uh, one of the designers, and they had just taken delivery of the uh, Lotus submarine from the James Bond movie. Really? He purchased that by auction, and he was having it delivered. So that's the kind of cars that this man likes. So wow. anyway, here's underground layer, I'm sure. So, that's awesome. All right. So 20 years, Internet, this all ties together somehow. Let me see, see if I can do it. So we started off with information and photos and pricing and availability and inventory. The promise was, you know, to do the full purchase, uh, build to order, um, the connected car, the social car. Maybe we're not all there yet or we're in transition. And then, of course, on the horizon we have the Internet of Things, the, the full connectivity and the autonomous car. And, you know, this all ties together even when I'm talking about companies like the Google Autonomous Car or Apple because keep in mind, these were companies that really benefited from this whole, not only Internet, but, you know, Apple before that with the, the computer, but this whole computerization uh, consumer, it, it's just been a, a wild, fun ride so far. So, you know, it, I'm going to mention the future real quick. I don't know that much about it as, as a beloved philosopher. Um, let's say, you know, the future to think what it used to be. Um, let me just make a couple quick points. People are getting older, and, and I mean, we all are, obviously, but the consumer as a whole are getting older as people are living longer and, and birth rates are going down in some of the developing countries. The middle class, regardless of the country, is growing, particularly in China, we know that. The planet is shrinking. Uh, products are coming from everywhere, going everywhere, and there's stresses, obviously, even on the resources. Urbanization is a big change. 70% uh, of the people on the planet will be living in some type of urban environment in not too long. But the values are changing. The youth values are changing. They, they, they want something that, that they can really identify with or feel good about or trust. And hopefully, and I, I've read this, but I really believe, uh, hopefully quality demand is going up. In quality of the product, quality of the experience, and, and this all kind of this again lays down a little bit of fun, uh, foundation. Let's, we, we have to talk to, about that pesky next generation because every generation has one, has a next one, I should say. Let's just uh, reveal a couple things about these people that, that are becoming our customers or even our employees, if not our children. Um, you know, we were raised to understand what this, this is. That, that's a word chart. We, uh, we had them around uh, when we took our job. Um, you know, they're, they're very militaristic in terms of, you know, you've got somebody in charge and then the people down, down the bit. These people that use today, next gen, you know, the, these guys, uh, since they were 12, they've been the, the chief technology officer of the household. These people, um, I'm going to go back to that, you know, they've been on computers their whole life. They're teaching adults. This is a different you know, when you begin this type of behavior in the family, it's hard to, to, to live a life outside of not having some degree of knowledge or responsibility above the elders or above the people that are theoretically in charge. Um, they're, di they're digital natives. They've, they've been on it their whole life. They've, they've come and gone. They've been there and back. These are the, the, the people that, that they've watched whatever they wanted to watch when they wanted to watch it. They've listened to whatever they want to watch, listen to whenever they wanted to. Information has always been available to them. How high is Kilimanjaro? How many people can fit in Yankee Stadium? They can answer those questions. They don't know, but they know where to find it, and they have it at the, at the tip of their fingers. And so these people are not very patient with processes and, and, uh, and time. They don't have to wait until a movie comes on. They can just watch it when they want to. It's, it's amazing that uh, 
some of the, the behaviors that we're trying to, uh, you know, subject them to. And, and that being said, when you try and subject them to behaviors, and here's the scary part, and I'm sorry for using a, uh, a, a bad picture, but this is how they perceive dealerships and car dealers. And didn't this go away a long time ago? Wasn't this part of the promise of the Internet that, that this kind of attitude or this, uh, you know, a disdain for our profession, for our professionals was going to go away? And this is the part that bothers me. And, and, and I just want to reiterate, in my role at Motor Trend Audio, I spend a lot of time with consumers. Now, as a guy from J.D. Power, Kelly Blue Book, uh, running the driving sales events or the J.D. Power events, I see the best and the brightest. I see people that really care about what they're doing and care about their customers and care about the people. But unfortunately, as I discover and when I go out into the masses, that's not really resonating all the way across. I want to talk about that a little bit. What does this, this, uh, this person, what do youth today, these uh, people from the internet uh, birth want? What, what is their ideal transaction? They want to see an interactive ad. They want to see something on uh, any one of their screens, whether it's mobile or television or, or computer, that they can touch into, and then they can personalize it. They're getting the full bin, the full disclosure on the vehicle, maybe the options and stuff. Their credit score or payment possibilities are already known. They're online. They're, they're locked in. They know what they can pay. They know how much they can spend. Their used car value, if there's one part of the, of the equation, they already know what it's worth. It's already been determined because it's constantly being updated. And guess what? They might even have a connected car at this time where lease value or payments are already worked into the car they're driving, therefore transferred to the next one. It's pretty simple. Well, actually, in the end, they just want to print their own 3D car and don't want to do any of this. But <laughs> the point is, these are all aspects of a purchase that add to the complexity of a vehicle purchase that make it more difficult. When people say, oh, you know, I'm on Amazon and stuff like that, I'm on the Internet, I'm really used to just buying stuff. Well, you know, buying a book is different than buying a car because you, you don't have as many options or packages and things or you don't necessarily aren't making payments on it and you don't have another book to trade in. Um, but I'm just saying that this could possibly go away. And since we're talking about Amazon, let's talk about disruptive technologies a little bit. So I kind of mentioned uh, the Dave Power. I used that term when I talked about J.D. Power and Associates. And his, his technology was disruptive in the fact that it made changes to, to the way business is done or what where priorities were. And we've certainly seen enough, and there, there are many in our life right now, in terms of I mentioned Amazon or whether it's Zappos, even Netflix, boy, if, if um, you're a blockbuster video, I think you certainly understand the disruptive technology behind Netflix, or Airbnb and cities of San Francisco, et cetera, are really having some fun experimenting uh, or, or trying to get their head around Airbnb. You know, the car itself was a disruptive technology when you think about it. If you made buggy whips or, or, or sold horses, the car coming down the road was certainly disruptive. But I want to point out to everyone, it wasn't so much the car that was disruptive, it was the mass marketing of the car because guess what, that made it available to everyone. The car was there, it was there for the rich and famous if they wanted to, but it wasn't until it was mass marketed or the prices came down that it became available to everyone. A lot of these technologies are available to everyone when you think about the fact that everybody's got a cell phone or connected to the internet, once again made that big level playing field. So let's go to our final question here and just talk a little bit about disruptive technologies. And uh, the question is, what disruptive technology do you use currently? Please select all that apply. So we have online retail like Amazon, Zappos, eBay, those kind of things. Uh, do you use Roku, Apple, or other non-cable streaming devices? Do you use Airbnb? How about Uber? Are you one of those? Uh, I, there's a, a word for people who use Uber, and I forgot what it is. Somebody will write in. What? Passenger. Passenger. <laughs> oh, Charlie, I love the way you put things. Or um, that new one, I can't remember its name. It's brand new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what disruptive technology do you use? Please select all of the fly. We're just curious. We just want to know. Um, once we get a majority of those votes in, we're going to close the poll and share the results. Um. <laughs> oh, I love these people who write into me and tell me jokes. That's awesome. Okay, so uh, the votes are coming in really fast. 
we want to know. Um, before Can I just say something while you're doing that? I just, you know, I'm getting tweets and stuff like that, and I'm so anxious to talk to everybody. I'm going to hurry up through the end here, but I just, uh, I'm having a ball. Usually we do this, you know, uh, I, I always do better if there's some kind of a drinking game involved. So. <laughs> But, um, I know, audience, please don't hate me. I told him he wasn't allowed to drink during the webinar. Maybe he'll drink during the Q&A session. We'll see what happens then. Why All right. I just on this line presentation first? Okay, let's get some answers. Let's get some answers. Let's close this poll, share the results. All right, 95% of today's audience said that they do use online retail, Amazon, Zappos, eBay, and the like. 69% of today's audience said they're fans of the Roku, Apple, and other non-cable streaming devices. Boy, that's a lot. That's higher than I thought it would be. 10% of today's audience said they like Airbnb. 48%, almost half, are Uber users. And 12% of today's audience said, yeah, that new one, can't remember its name, but it's out there. <laughs> you know what I'm talking okay. about. <laughs> Okay, let's, 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 let's try and wrap this up and make some strong points here. So Uber, we talked about that. So Uber is, is, is a, is a you, you dealer, the dealer community, the, the, the way we do business is threatened by um, disruptive technology. How do I know that? I'm just saying that because everybody essentially is. But if you're doing involved in a process that people don't like and, and vilify you, then yes, you better be under threat. And you're not only a threat because... People are buying less cars because they don't need to own them because of Uber or Lyft. Uh, BMW is even involved with the Active E right now, Zipcar. There's a lot of different ways people can get involved in vehicles and mobility without owning the car. But more importantly, Uber is a disruptive technology for those that are actually making money in this, the taxis. Guess what? Taxis really felt pretty protected in all this because they had these medallions and they really didn't you know, feel that they are ever going to be, um, you know, at risk. But guess what? We all didn't like taxis. We didn't like the process, the laws around them. Did you know you could only hail cabs in, in Manhattan? You couldn't call for them. And guess what? In the other bureaus, you could only call for them. You couldn't hail them. What the heck is wrong with that? So, so in other words, they're all at risk right now. Taxi companies around the country, if not around the world, are at risk. They had medallions. These medallions that were worth hundreds of thousands of dollars are falling in value. Dealers, guess what? You've got franchise law. That's great. And, and, and it makes sense when it makes sense. And what is the disruptive technology? Boy, I don't know. And, and every now and then, as I'm speaking to you guys, I'm thinking I, I'm preaching to the choir. You guys, everybody on this, taking the time to listen to a webinar like this cares about this stuff. So I get that you're aware. But, you know, if, if we can think about all the things that you're working on, and I mean that broadly, even uh, this is why I wanted to kind of bring this presentation up. This is a whole concept about can you see the, the forest through the trees. So what we're working on, these are all the different things that happen at different uh, conferences and things like that, live chat, Facebook, QR codes, advertising, digital not one price, pricing strategies, websites, digital marketing. And to solve all these questions, to solve all of your wonderment, you have the beloved third parties. And, you know, again, the title says I was going to tear these apart. I'm hopefully going to get to some Q&A time here that I can have some conversation about individuals. But I just want to make the comment, I get so frustrated when I see Dealers, the people that are involved in the business, the people that are working hard day in, day out, getting taken advantage of. You know, sure, I began this conversation a little while back by saying consumers feel like they're getting taken advantage of, but as this gets more complex, I'm seeing licensing fees where people are having to pay licensing to get their own data or they're getting double charged for it. That is a separate thing. It's your data. Why is anybody else using it or profiting from it? They should be paying you for that information. They're, they're, you're chasing KPIs. What is the next big KPI? And you've got too many tools or processes in there. A lot of times when I'm putting together a conference or something, I'll talk to a dealer and say, what do you want to hear about? They say, just tell me what I have. Tell me what I have and how to use it because I don't even know that. There's a number of companies out there. I put them up here. I'm not picking on them, but I'm picking on the concept. Google you know, is, is taking over the world, bless their hearts, and they're creating all of these obstacles to business when they're doing it. They don't understand the car business. They're treating car dealers like they're freaking neighborhood florists or Hallmark stores, and they don't understand how expensive and complex the business is, and they're just getting in the way all the time. Yelp, 
I will say Yelp is purposely getting in the way because they're not making money or getting attention unless there's a bad review on something that they can somehow, I don't know whether they're, they're becoming part of the crowd and, 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 you know, dealers are trying to do the right thing or trying to show, you know, uh, positive reviews because guess what? The dealers that are doing the right thing, the whole attitude around dealerships aren't going to change. True Car is on here. Please don't everyone blow up and say Charlie hates True Car, whether that's true or not. I'm just saying the concept of True Car, changing how cars are sold. This is the same thing that I showed you on all of those old 20-year-old websites. Unless people perceive the problem of buying a car is the dealer, a company like True Car doesn't exist. All of those other websites were that way because that's the way everyone felt and nobody wanted to even go to a dealer website. They wanted to go to a, um, a third party site. You know, now then they started going to the OEM sites and now they're starting to go to the dealer sites. The only message TrueCar can give is that you got to come to us because going to the dealer isn't the right place to go. You got to come to us. And, and, and you know what? I blame all of you. I blame the industry for that. We got to do something. So here's what I'm summarizing. You got more competition from inside and out. That means from car companies and even you know Apple or, or Google or something like that. You got a more complex product. Maybe you understand it. Maybe you don't. You got more complex process. You got consumerism, which through third parties, as I just was mentioning, are squeezing your profits. Everybody hates you. The OEMs are well. You can fill in the blank here. And then there's a disruptive technology around the corner that's going to ruin everything for you. So I just want to say, everything is awesome. <laughs> Take a deep breath here. Is it? Is it? <laughs> You're not going to. So what are you going to do with that? I like this picture, so I just had to put it in somewhere. You can't just leave behind. Understand everything you're doing. Understand all of your process. Understand start to finish. Now, again, I'm talking at a real high level here. I mentioned at the beginning I wasn't going to be very specific about process. There's some great trainers out there, the likes of David Kane and others that have, have done things for, for people. There's some great conferences, like obviously driving sales that I'm involved in, others out there that, that, that can remind you of things. But understand what you're doing from a big picture. Invite everyone to a seat at the table. I'm talking about your customers. I'm talking about your employees. Invite them to, to tell you what's going right, what's going wrong, what do they like or not. You already mentioned 98% of you are involved in retail on the Internet. For crying out loud, if that's the basis of how we like to do business, are you doing your business that way? And, and I say this, shine a light on the unwritten rules of the hierarchy. You know, when we blast away something like an org chart, what don't you like? What is, is it just you don't like the coffee cups you have to use or anything like that? I mean, let's blow this up. And then tap into the power of ownership. I mean, you've got some great employees around you. You've got people. You know, let them take ownership of the deal, whether it's developing their own customer base or getting a little bit extra when they do or that type of thing. I guess this is three T's here on the next generation that, that they like. They want technology. They want it to be latest and greatest because you'll be judged on the process if you're going, uh, you know, if you're not using the latest stuff. They value time. Don't make them take hours and hours. We, the industry, need to shorten the start to finish on this. Trust is a big thing, and transparency is the overused word tied to that. Yes, they need to trust you, and, and, and that, that comes through behavior. Um, and then they, they want to be told. They want you to tell them, or, and whether that means text or talk, I'm not going to say. They all begin with T, so pick the word. But they want to, they want to know what's going on. They want to know what they, they need to know. What are the best practices? I showed all those different ways of doing things. All I know is this, in-house or outsource. Guess what? I use the, the term any dealer can do his own TV commercials. And a lot of them do, but most of them shouldn't. You know, do what you know how to do. <laughs> Social media the same way. You know, again, people, there, there's good people and bad people. If you know how to do it, fine. But don't do it just because you can do it. But social media is all about that communication. It's about building the trust, and that's where the reputation. But let me focus on price. For crying out loud, we've been at this for 20 years on the Internet. People want to know what the price is. Show the price and have it be one price. Wait a second. Am I saying don't negotiate? No. I'm saying just have a price. If you're selling that car, it doesn't matter if it's on the lot or on the Internet. That's your price for that car. Or, and if you choose to negotiate from that, fine. I'm not going to get into that. That's your choice. But I'm saying don't have a separate dealer price. And do what you should, not what you could. And this is the illustration. Is, these are people walking dogs. We all know nowadays, and here's another change, you're supposed to pick up the poop, for crying out loud. If any of us that have walked a dog and the dog's out somewhere, 
It may poop. You don't want to pick it up. You look around. Is anybody looking at you? Maybe not. So you leave it. Well, guess what? Maybe somebody saw you. Don't be doing things in your dealership that's leaving poop around for crying out loud. Do what's right and do it all the time and be consistent about that because consumers are paying attention to our industry. They don't like us. They don't want us to do well and they're trying to find someone else. And I don't mean that for everyone because guess what? Cars are awesome. I already established that. But your customers are your customers. Own them. Own your customers. Keep them for life and treat them right by doing that. You're an important part of your community. This last little illustration here is there's a little market in our town. Everything there costs more than it does. We have Safeway, we have Whole Foods, we have TJ in our town, and this market thrives because they've always been an important part of the community. They treat people right, and it isn't just about price. It's all about, you know, again, respect and trust and things like that. And dealers certainly are an important part of the community. How are you going to do this? How are you going to do this? I had here's our suggested resources. Conferences and training. Obviously, the dealer on webinars. Your peers. You guys need to work together, for crying out loud. You're not alone in this. You've got to go through your 20 groups or your uh, associations. And finally, of course, there's Sean Rains. And I just had to put that on there because I'm assuming he's going to pay me big bucks to do that. <laughs> Does oh, he even I'm know? Take a breath and just remind everyone that everything is awesome. So you're a fan of the internet, I'm guessing. I've been on it. I'm not a fan of PowerPoint right now, but I'm a big fan of it. <laughs> like a trooper, Charlie. Thank you so much. That was extremely fun and, and wonderful to hear you talk about the internet. And audience, if you haven't gotten your questions yet in for the one and only Charlie Vogelheim, what are you waiting for? We're going to get to that question and answer session. I expect it to be wonderful and robust, and we want to hear your questions. Ask him anything. I like to say, I like to say, stump the presenter. But in this case, I think you should just ask him for his opinion. Which one do you like better, chocolate or vanilla? That kind of thing. But vanilla, um, <laughs> vanilla really? You're a vanilla guy? Oh, I would not have guessed that, Charlie. Vote. Well, you can always put chocolate on it. <laughs> Well, you heard him, peoples. So get your questions in. Before we get to those questions, though, we have some fun to take care of. I love this. I don't know if you know this about me, but I have a little Monty Hall thing going on, and I love giving out prizes, especially to the people who, who come to these webinars and, and try and learn something every week. So this week, I'm extremely excited about this prize. I really wish I could win it. But um, if you missed it at the beginning of the webinar, well, let me tell you, I announced that our good friends at Motor Trend Audio giving away the coolest prize ever. One of you lucky webinar attendees is going to be winning a guest spot at an upcoming Motor Trend Audio podcast with Charlie Vogelheim. Now, the date, you got to pick it. The topic, well, you got to pick that too. But as long as it's about cars, that's what you guys are going to do it on. Um, you're going to be a guest of the show to join the conversation, as Charlie likes to say and discuss issues that affect the auto industry. Awesome, right? Yes, totally a wow prize. So get ready, get to your keyboards. The first person to write in the correct response to this question is going to be winning this awesome prize today. Before we go forward, Charlie, am I asking, this is only for dealership personnel, or are vendors able to do this too? Anybody, anybody that wants to answer can. Anybody? Oh, man. Well, you know what, you, you, you get to see the answer, so only the people you like. <laughs> okay, right. Sure, sure, sure. Okay, everyone, even you vendors are able to do this. This is awesome. I just, I love, love, love this. And just so you know, this question is not a lay down question. I purposely told him to make it hard, and he did. You would have had to have been paying attention. He did not say it, but he showed it on a screen. So hopefully you guys are paying attention. The question is... What was the color of the very first car sold on the internet? Holy moly! First person to write in got it. I can't believe it. <laughs> David Sharp, you are our winner. Green is correct. It was a teal green Volvo. It was the very first car sold on the internet. They showed it up. They showed the price. At, no, they didn't show the price, but he showed the year, make and model. And he showed a picture of the car. And if you just looked at the picture, it kind of looked like it was black. I got you. I got you. I see. Yeah, it did kind of look is black. It black it wasn't. Is it blue? Is it white? Is it, is it blue? <laughs> I know, right? No, it 
wasn't it wasn't white and gold and it wasn't black and blue but it was green and David Sharp you're our winner pal congratulations um, uh, wow that was such an awesome I cannot wait to hear that podcast that was awesome um, thank you everyone for playing along congratulations to David Sharp you're our winner today and of course we want to thank our good friends at Motor Trend Audio for their incredible generosity. Awesome, awesome yeah, prize, Charlie. Think you'll, you'll obviously be a celebrity, just no one will know what you look like. <laughs> I love it, I love it. Sharpie, you got to tell me how, how it turns out, how you like the whole iPod uh, thing, so uh, that's awesome. Okay, let's go to the question and answer session. Are you ready, Charlie? I am, I am. Please. Cool. You can turn on your webcam now so people can see that you're a real-life person and not a robot or a machine. Well, you, you can be the judge of that. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm still writing down Sharpie's information. Okay, here we go. Okay, um, we don't have a lot of questions. I thought you'd get more questions from the audience. Audience, I'm counting on you to bring me some more questions. Your first question actually comes from the one and only Sean Rains. Sean says, Charlie, in your opinion, who do you think is better for the automotive industry, Scott Painter or Elon Musk? Interesting question. Of course, Scott Painter, CEO and founder of TrueCar, and Elon Musk, the same for Tesla. Charlie, what do you think? Well, interestingly enough, they're friends, or they know each other in Southern California. I would say that you know easily Elon, because he's bringing in a new technology, and um, certainly the concept of uh, out retailing outside the franchise system is a disruptor, but it's certainly something that I think, you know, we need to get things shaken up every now and then. You could, you know, you could argue that there's not a high volume of cars or kind of specialties, so it doesn't really matter, but at least it has us uh, going with the conversation. That's similar to Scott in, in terms of the, the true car idea, in terms of being disruptive, but you know, unfortunately, and, and I, again, I'm not picking on him, I'm not picking on true car, I just can't support the concept that there needs to be a third party. You know, there's already a manufacturer, and then there's a dealer, and ideally, you know, at that point, then there's a consumer. So um, I think if everything's going right, that's the way things should be. I love it. I love it. Right, Sean, thank you so much for the great question. Charlie, your next question comes to you from Andrew. Andrew says, what is the single most important thing a dealer should focus on to break away from the awful car salesman stereotype. He he wrote it in that time when you uh, were showing that picture of the guy yeah. in the awful pink uh, polyester again, suit. Obviously <laughs> a picture because you know they, you can have you know good looking young kids you know standing out in front but at the same time if the process is bad unfortunately and this is a little bit you know I want to make a point that, that everyone needs to work together on this because and I use that dog walking uh, picture just because you can love dogs and you can love people but you don't like you know dog crap around your neighborhood and unfortunately if you see one person get in the way with it you make the assumption everybody's doing it that way so you're guilty by association to a certain extent and that's what's happening with dealerships as I talk to consumers about it because I, I get troubled by it I love dealers I have some great friends that are dealers and then I meet a consumer they go oh I would do everything I could to avoid going in the dealership I go why <laughs> well I had this friend that, that went to this person and this is what happened to him and I just don't want to experience that I'm going to offer crying out loud you know I try and tell them the dealers that, that, that I know are well and, make, and good and I think that would be great if we could do that you know there were attempts a long time ago Auto by Tell being one uh, JD Power even tried to certify dealers that, that would be part of this dealer group meant that you were going to be treated a-OK -okay. and uh, unfortunately there was never any teeth behind that you know um, to a certain extent you could argue that's what's happening with the likes of a true car and maybe even something like the Costco program that through your better association but at the same time that means you're putting somebody in front of the dealer so I think you need to just make sure all of the dealers are on board and we just unfortunately it's it's easier sometimes to make money off of somebody that really isn't that well informed or or you know, is willing to pay more money for it, and, and it's, so it's, I don't know, I, whether we all go to one pricing or something like that, it's, but it, in this, the, the answer going back to it is, you need to stand together, you need to get your, the dealers, not only your behavior, but the dealers around you, treating everyone openly and, and trustworthy. <laughs> well, 
Uh, thank you so much for that. Andrew has a couple more questions that will be coming up in just a bit. All of a sudden, we got a ton of questions that flew in, so this is great. Thank you so much, audience. Let's get to some more of these questions. Your next question comes to you from, well, let's do, let's do this one from Christine. Christine says, what are your thoughts on the Apple Car announcement? And just, Christine's not alone. Elmer also wrote in, uh, not a question, but a message. It's rumored that Apple is going to base their car on the BMW i3. What do you think about that? Charlie, what do you think about oh, this Apple car? You, you know, it's so what's, what's great, I, you know, I moved to the, back to the San Francisco area where I grew up uh, just in the last couple of years. And this is a fantastic area in terms of the amount of technology that's going on here and how much they share the technology. I mean, there are speaker groups and, and conferences, and, and everybody's all about shared technology except Apple, in some cases, Google. They really like to keep things close to the best. So Apple Car, you know, they're making an announcement. They are getting involved with the, the tie-in with, the, you know, the iPhone or the, the OS to the car. We know that that's going to happen. That's going to be coming out soon. But in terms of the car itself, when they talk about it and people all of a sudden poo-poo it, and I hear a lot of that coming from the Detroit-centric type of way of thinking that, oh, that means that, you know, it's going to be very complex. You have to make an um, a assembly plant and, and suppliers and everything. But no, you don't. That's why it's a great question about the BMW. You could work with existing, uh, you could private label the car. You could build it in China. That's where you're building you know, your millions and millions of iPhones and iPads and Macs. So you know, there is manufacturing capabilities over there. Yes, there's all kinds of levels of you know, import and, and uh, I'm sorry, I'm not going to get into all the complaints. I'm thinking about, you know, the uh, uh, currency exchange and all this other stuff. So I'm sorry. Um, you made me think too much. Uh, I hate when so I do that to my presenters. I do. <laughs> so, so I just think that, that you've got to think that it's a reality, that they're going to explore it. It's not going to cost them. I mean, when you've got $200 billion, you know, if you spent half a billion or even a billion on development, then you're going to know. So I would say, Yes, you're going to see some development in that, and whether it's a shared platform like you suggest with the BMW or with some of their Chinese manufacturing tie-ins, there's going to be some form of that vehicle. The autonomous car itself, whether it's going to be that or not, is, is part of the question. Is that what Apple's really trying to do? Are they, they always are going toe-to-toe -to -toe with their, their friends over at Google uh, just across the town. So. And ironically, Christine, who asked about the Apple car announcement, she has a follow-up question. It says, what is riding in a Google car like? Charlie, did you happen to take a, a little swing around in a Google car? I have uh, not. I've actually got it scheduled for next week. I really? Met, I met with the autonomous team, and it was funny, and, and it kind of alluded to that. So Google is, is very outgoing on their terms. So Google made a presentation at the Automotive News event this last uh, January, you know, tied in with the, new, the uh, Detroit Auto Show, and you know, met Chris Oldman, and we, we got along great. We talked about both being from the Bay Area, come on down and see. And then, you, you, so you reach out to them and say, well, now you need to talk to the press people. So then I talked to the press people, and then they're like, oh, hey, we got to put you in one of the cars. You haven't been in one yet. But it, it's these bizarre steps along the way. It, it, in other words, they will put people in the car in their situation, and I've gotten a chance to talk to several people, but I want to get in both cars. So they have the Lexus that have the, uh, you know, again, it's fully operational as a vehicle, but what you're supposed to do is once you get on the highway, you're supposed to take your hands and, and feet off the pedals and steering wheel, and then, of course, there's the all-autonomous car that has no pedals or steering wheel. So hopefully I'll be able to report on that soon. Interesting. Thank you for the great question, Christine. Okay, next question. Let's get back to this uh, question from Andrew. He has a few concerns about the way things are going right now in the auto industry. So, for instance, he says um, he'd like to know your opinion on the old Saturn no haggle pricing model. You know, where you would just walk into a Saturn, the price that was on the car, that was the price. There was no haggling. Well, now Saturn's not here anymore, and now that's been done away with. Do you think that was a smart move, or do you think that maybe in the future we should go back to that? Do you think that's what consumers want? So, so Saturn was interesting in a couple ways. You know, certainly starting a, a car division outside of Detroit. This is a General Motors-owned division, and they set it up down in Tennessee. 
And uh, then, of course, they had the technology about the, the plastic door panels, the assembly. They had this bulletproof engine, the lost foam uh, casting technique on that engine. Uh, so there was, there was something to talk about the product-wise. And then they set up the retailing as regional retailing. In other words, you know, you got kind of a market area, the same dealer. So there could be multiple stores, but they were all owned by the same dealer. And then, of course, that was necessary to kind of support both interest in the car and then the availability or the ability to, to maintain the pricing structure. So I liked that setup, and, and, and it was certainly very valid. And I have to tell you, we had employees at Kelly Blue Book that bought Saturns only because of the process. It wasn't necessarily the car of choice over time. And unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of reinvestment in the product itself. So to have it kind of stand alone as an island was interesting, but in the end was its demise because, you, you, again, you have to continually develop the product and it has to continually be appealing. But what happened was there were people that, that went over and were put through the rigmarole, the standard rigmarole of, of buying a car, and then they went to a Saturn store and they bought the car just because of the process. So I know people that did that and were incredibly satisfied by that. So once again, it's just what are the expectations of the consumer and the current way things are done is a bad expectation. So, um, you know, I'd like to say that, you know, I was, I was very interested in them succeeding just because it was outside of the norm at the time. Things have really changed now in the big shakeup after the world economic downturn that that type of thing would really be uh, accepted at a different level, and particularly if it was an entire successful make model setup. I do have to say one thing uh, along the OEM lines. Uh, I did walk the floor of NADA with a representative from one of the OEMs as they were trying to piece together that electronic start to finish type of transaction where a consumer could actually walk that path of an interactive um, add to ownership uh, purely on, on the electronic side of the world. So it's, it's interesting for me to see the, uh, the OEMs all looking at this retailing as something that maybe you know, needs to be reviewed. Really? Huh. And I guess you can't tell us which OEM that was. No. And it doesn't <laughs> begin with an E and end with a W. Okay. Good to know. Great question, Andrew. Uh, Andrew goes on to say that recently he found himself on the consumer side. Uh, he went into a dealership to buy a new Honda Pilot, and he spent two hours waiting on the F&I guy. And he was, um, well, I'm not going to say what he wrote, but let's just say he wasn't happy. So yeah. what can dealers do, uh, in your opinion, Boy, to, no, I mean, no, I don't think they realized the consumers don't want to spend hours in a dealership. So my daughter uh, found a car, and it happened to be at a dealership uh, in Southern California where I was living, and I said, okay, I'll go pick it up. So uh, agreed upon price, agreed upon product, all done online, you know, at a dealership. It's all being done. I'm swinging by. I have the check in hand. I'm going to pick up the car and go. Over two hours. And it's like, wait a second. I mean, this isn't even shocking or anything like that. I get the fact it is the, the highest regulated product that we can buy. There are pages and pages that we have to go over. But I just sold a house, and I did everything online. I had, a, you know, a electronic signing and, and everything happened, and it took less time for me to sell a house that I had owned for 30 years than it took to buy a car uh, at a dealership in person. So that's just not right. Um, and, it, yes, it's not all the dealer's fault in that case, uh, but unfortunately, you know, there's got to be some ways, and this is where you, the dealers, um, uh, and or the vendors that are truly helping the dealers should be demanding the change for this. You need to be working this through because the consumers aren't happy about it, and they'll seek uh, a disruptive technology to solve their problems. Charlie, <laughs> I think if there's one thing that could make consumers like dealerships more is to make the actual getting the car into a consumer's hands part easier and so I totally agree with exactly what you just said. Andrew, thank you for the great comments. Our next comment comes from Bill. Bill says, it seems like this presentation was geared towards dealers. I'm surprised at the Tesla poll results. It doesn't seem like too many dealers are on this webinar based on the preference of the first poll answer compared to the one about Tesla. 
But as my follow-up to my comment, which sounded disparaging but was absolutely not meant to be, Charlie said Tesla was a very small sector of the industry. But doesn't that sort of open the door to bypassing the franchise system that we have in place now? Charlie, do you have any comments? Well, yeah, I, I'm really glad you brought that up, too. I was really surprised also at the reaction, so I'm, I'm curious in terms of, of where, what these people's livelihood is. But let me say it this way. So, uh, yeah, so it's a great car. It's a really cool technology, and if you haven't sat in a car or, or, or seen it or gone for a ride, I really recommend it for no other reason than that it's part of our industry and that you understand uh, what it is. It's, it is a relatively low volume. Um, I could wish that uh, the auto industry uh, embraced it to the extent to say, let's, let's understand what franchise law is all about, why we have it, um, is, does it apply to this. I'm not a big slippery slope guy all the time that just says if you, you creak the door open a little bit, then all of a sudden it swings wide open. I think that, that fighting it uh, to a certain extent, depending on what states you're in or what the, um, uh, the consumer attitude of that state might be, could be uh, fraught with peril to the extent that if you're, if you're really just protecting uh, what appear to be um, uh, wealthy uh, retailers that, uh, that aren't treating their own customers right, that could be problematic. I have seen franchise law work the way it was intended. I have seen uh, dealers mistreated by OEMs, and I have seen them uh, adequately protected by the franchise law. So that being said, I just want, you know, consumers should understand is there a reason for it, and, and what are the benefits to them? Now, protection of franchise law is changing. Keep in mind, years ago, decades ago, there were you know dealers that worked and lived in the communities. Um, one of the things that happened through you know relationship with you know, in the last 20 years was the public, um, the the fact that dealerships could go public. I'm sorry, that the fact that dealerships now the largest dealership in our country that owns you know hundreds of dealerships is based in Florida, Auto Nations or is part of the Lithia Group or all of these other public companies, Sonic, for instance. Um, and by the way, if you get a chance to listen to the podcast, one of the ones that might be of interest to everyone that's in the industry is I did a whole podcast on Echo Park, which is Sonic's uh, um, competition to CarMax. It's a used car lot, and he talked about pain points a lot and, and reviews the different pain points that consumers have in the process. So it's a, it's a good... A uh, good one to listen to from an industry standpoint. Not nearly as fun from an enthusiast standpoint, but what now? It's about cars. Um, <laughs> to go back to what you're saying is, is now these public companies aren't individuals that live in this, these towns, and they're not taking the local politicians out for the golf game or getting to know them or, or necessarily donating in the form of personality to the local community. I, you know, certainly the general managers and, and employees there are important parts of the community. But my point in all that is, is that maybe, yes, maybe there is... Uh, some crumbling with the understanding of the need for franchise law in different states. And keep in mind that franchise law is a state law. So I think that, uh, that first of all, the car dealers and the individual states need to understand what type of competition, if any, Tesla presents, and is there a value to, to keeping them out of the state or not. But do it intelligently. Don't do it just because he's going outside of franchise law. And maybe there's something that can be learned from it. And maybe there's benefits that can be made. Because guess what? Your consumers are going in a certain direction. And if they're driving past you and moving on and you're standing there and Tesla is farther down the road, that's a bad thing. So you just, again, need to understand where your consumers are going and make sure that you're going along with them. Got you. Uh, Bill did write back and he said, that battle is ongoing right now in my home state of Connecticut. Bill, we wish you the very best of luck. Thank you for the great question and great answer, Charlie. Okay, let's get to these last few questions and then we'll close up the webinar. This is a great question that came in from Bob. He says, what could the OEMs do better to assist retailers to sell more cars? What do you think the OEMs are lacking. They're not sharing well, enough first, with the dealers. First of all, you know, top to bottom, uh, a team attitude. In, in other words, understanding and, and recognizing that the dealers are their customers. The dealers aren't the ones in the way between them and their customers. They, they developed a franchise with these dealers. The dealers are their customers. So when they're doing things, yes, they want to sell more cars. Yes, they want to make the car owners happier, but work with the dealers, not against them in that process. And I think we've all seen some great individuals that work for OEMs that are there to help out the dealers 
And unfortunately, we've seen attitudes from up high come down that it's just like, look, we've got these darn dealers, and we'd really like to do stuff with the consumers, but the dealers are in the way. Unfortunately, yes, there are individual dealers that might be in the way, but I would say from the OEM standpoint, you know, write it down. You make cars, and your customer is the dealers, and the more cars that they sell, the better are you, better off you are. So just make them successful, not necessarily bypassing them going to the consumer. Agreed. Bob, thank you so much for the great question. Charlie, your next question comes from Gary May. Hey, Gary, how you doing? Friend of the show. He says, uh, did Charlie get a haircut? Yeah, that's the question that he wrote. <laughs> I got a mom cut. <laughs> looking good, looking good. Okay, last question came in from Diane. I have been holding on to this question. Diane and I both want to know, what was Charlie's CB handle? What was the handle that you used? <laughs> when? When you talked about your CB. You said you had a CB earlier on in your presentation. We want to know what your handle was. Oh, yeah, the CB. Oh, yeah. Um, you know what? Um, you know, my gang name is Chad Behan, <laughs> but, um, the, uh, you know, I, I was uh, – in that uh, beige Vista Cruiser, I ended up buying that from my parents, and I, I, I took that to college, and I had a CB, and I had one of those uh, uh, speakers in the front so I could make noise and, and talk to people that were walking on the street, and it was pathetic. I mean, it was a <laughs> big old car that, that, you know, you didn't need a key to operate it, you didn't need to, it wouldn't lock, it didn't have an odometer or, or a gas gauge that worked, but I had it for six years. It was awesome. Um, so, you know, I, depending on my, you know, I might have been the cruiser, I might have been the Vista, and I might have been Bird Home, which is, is English for Vogelheim. But uh, I just can't remember anything except it seemed like every time I, I used it, I got in trouble somehow. <laughs> Charlie, you are phenomenal presenter. Thank you for being so gracious and, and wonderful and funny and charming and educational and just plain all around brilliant. I appreciate you so much for being here today. Thank you so much. Hey, it was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Was this the real one or is this still the practice? Or what no, no, do this is the real one, you dork. <laughs> you were awesome. Thank you, Charlie. Everyone, please uh, check out Charlie Vogelheim's uh, uh, podcast on iTunes. He is always this wonderful. I promise you. He is. Thank you, Charlie. I hope you have a great day. You can turn off your webcam now if you feel like it. Okie dokie. Okay, well, audience, I want to remind you that uh, this, the copy of this webinar recording is going to be emailed to you later today for your reference. Feel free to share it with your friends and colleagues. We're also going to be posting it online within 24 hours. All you have to do is go to dealeron.com slash webinars, and from there you can view our upcoming webinar schedule or access any of our past webinars. And, oh, you flew right past that. Yeah, check out iTunes, fill out the survey. <laughs> Thanks, what do you want me to do? <laughs> you know what? You're here. Just stay right here. Go have yourself a mental margarita right now, okay? <laughs> or a real <laughs> one, if that's what you're into. <laughs> All right. Audience, I want you to know invitations will be going out tomorrow for our next webinar, the four costly follow-up mistakes that you can fix right now. That's right. Follow-up emails are, of course, a crucial element to the selling process. They can literally make or break a relationship with a potential client. Most sales professionals have had the unenviable experience of repeatedly sending out follow-up emails and hearing nothing back. So the question is, are your follow-up emails adding value and helping, helping the consumer move through the decision-making process? Or are they just follow-up emails? In this exciting one-hour webinar presentation, Todd Smith, CEO of Active Engage, discusses how to make awesome emails that get opened, read, and responded to in order to put more money in your pocket. He's going to show you how eliminating four common blunders from your follow-up emails is a surefire way to increase your response rate. Attendees will also learn effective ways to test your email responses and templates, how to deploy a dedicated follow-up team and efficient escalation process, types of content that you should include in your follow-up, and various elements of emails 
that can be utilized to increase response rates. This is your opportunity to gain invaluable insight into where dealerships are currently failing in the follow-up process and learn from their mistakes so that you can increase response rates and sell more cars. So if you're ready to learn the four costly follow-up mistakes that you can fix right now, then this is the webinar you can't afford to miss. Don't forget, DealerOn's weekly webinars are held every Thursday at 12 noon Eastern, 11 a.m. Central, 10 a.m. Mountain, and 9 a.m. Pacific. And if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions regarding these webinars and our topics, contact me directly. I love to hear from you. My name is Eliana Raggio, and you can track me down online. I'm on I'm, on, I'm everywhere, really. I mean, name it, and I'm there. Facebook, Twitter, Google+. I'm on all the automotive social networks. Or you can email me directly at Eliana at DealerOn.com. Thank you all so very much for spending this time with us today, and I hope to see you all on another webinar in DealerOn's continuing education series. Take care, and have a great one.